Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Before we get into uh, the service this morning and the lesson, I want to uh, give an announcement that I'm sure will be made again at the end of the service, but just for emphasis sake, I want to start off with that. And that's to remind especially our parents and parents of teens in particular that Phil Robertson will be here this, this weekend, Friday, uh, Saturday. Uh, to uh, provide a parenting seminar. And again, the focus of that is to help parents of teenagers, but we encourage uh, parents who have younger children who will hopefully one day uh, grow to be teenagers so that you can be preparing in advance for the particular challenges that will be faced during those years. Now, uh, to allay any confusion because people have asked, this is not the Phil Robertson of Duck Dynasty. This is the Phil Robertson who looks like Steve Carell. So uh, it'll, it'll even be more confusing when you, when you get here and see him. Um, he will also uh, remain over the weekend and, and lead our thoughts at the Lord's Supper next Sunday morning. So look forward to that, be praying for it, and uh, also we encourage parents to sign up so that we can plan on everyone's uh, being there. All right, uh, so we are in the midst and really are right in the middle of, I think this is the middle lesson of our series that we are entitling, We Believe, and it has to do with some of the very center core beliefs that we hold to as Christians, beliefs that without which there would be no Christianity. These are not peripheral things uh, or things of secondary or, or third level importance, but things that are at the very heart of what we believe as Christians. And um, last week, we focused on the fact that Jesus died for our sins and our memory verse based on that uh, belief is 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3, which says, and let's say it together, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So as you see here, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I say that these are things that are not of secondary importance, but what scripture themselves refer to as matters of first importance. In fact, a few verses prior to this, as Paul opens the closing chapter of his letter to the Corinthians, he says that this is the gospel. Uh, it's the gospel upon which he takes his stand, and the f things of first importance related to that gospel have to do with such matters as the death of Christ for our sins in fulfillment of Scripture. But what I want you to notice this morning is that not only does Paul tell us that the death of Jesus on the cross for our sins is a matter of first importance, but he continues on and says this in the next two verses, that he was buried and that he, raised, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And so Jesus not only died for our sins, but he was buried and rose again the third day. All of this in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy or scripture. And so these again form the foundation stones of the gospel, the good news that we, we take our, our stand on and believe in. I think if you would allow me to condense this even more, and it's believed by the vast majority of scholars, every scholar I've ever referenced on this accepts that these words on our screen were probably something that was memorized, repeated, probably sung or chanted, however they did that in the first century, uh, and was circulated broadly among Christians as a very core part of their beliefs and values. But if we could boil that down even tighter so that we could say it ourselves, I've done this before and I, I like to do it pretty much every year because I think this is something that could, we would be benefited by having emblazoned in our memories. We could convince all this to say that Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead and was seen. In fact, since we're all in the mood already to uh, speak out loud, I want to encourage you to say this with me again. We're going to say it twice. Christ died for our sins and was buried. 
He rose from the dead and was seen. One more time. Christ died for our sins and was buried. He rose again and was seen. Very good. So thank you all for affirming that because this is our message this morning that we believe that Jesus rose again. On the third day, Jesus rose again. Now this is a challenge for people to believe, but what I want us to understand first this morning is that it's not only a challenge for modern people living in a, quote, enlightened and scientific age. This was difficult for people to believe when it happened in the first century. It was a challenge because people, when they die, in case you haven't noticed, tend to stay dead. That's not only true today. That was true in the first century. It was true regarding the people who knew Jesus, and when they saw that he was crucified, dead, and buried, expected that he would remain in the grave from that point forward. And so it took quite a bit to convince them otherwise. As Reese read for us a moment ago in uh, Matthew chapter 28, we come to the passage in which our memory verse for this week will be found in a few moments. But the story is, is laid out for us this way. This is after Jesus' death. He's been in the tomb, we say three days, and that throws some people because we talk about Friday, he was crucified, then Saturday, and then Sunday, but he was laid in the tomb on Friday evening, Sunday morning early. That's like barely more than 24 hours, so how can you say three days? But in the both Jewish and Roman day a way of, of reckoning, any part of a day counted as a whole. So Friday evening, day one, Saturday, day two, Sunday morning, day three. So on the third day, Jesus rose after the Sabbath. So on the first day of the week, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. I want you to notice again, they didn't go to see the resurrected Christ. They weren't going there expecting that they were going to talk to the risen Jesus. They were going to the tomb in order to see it like you might visit the grave of a deceased friend. Or as I think it's Luke or John that makes mention of the fact they were carrying with them additional spices in order to more properly or complete the job of embalming, as, as it were, perfuming, uh, going through the, the rituals that the Jews practiced to show honor and respect for the deceased. So that's what they're on their way early Sunday morning to do. And it says that, behold, there was a great earthquake for, and this is the cause of that earthquake, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow, and fear, for fear of him, the guards trembled, because there had been a detachment of guards placed there to prevent the disciples from coming and stealing the body. But they became like dead men in their fear of this awesome event. But the angel said to the women who now approached, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. You've come to minister to the deceased body of your Lord, but he is not here. He has risen, as he said, come see the place where he lay. I think this is really interesting, and one of the things that will blow you away as a student of the Bible is that no matter how many times you read a particular passage, it never fails to register something new with you. And I've read Matthew 28, I don't know, well over a hundred times in my lifetime, and pretty well felt like as I approached it this week that there would, you know, it would be good to read it again, but there would be really nothing new that would, that would come to mind. But the thing that was, as it were, r- revealed to me as I, as I read it this time is that this, this angel didn't come to roll back the tomb in order to let Jesus out. I don't know, maybe for some reason or other that had kind of always been there in my thinking that the angel rolled the stone away so that Jesus could come out of the tomb. But clearly, as you read carefully the text, that's not what's going on. He didn't roll the, two, the, the stone away so that Jesus could come out. He rolled the stone away so that we could come in and look 
and see the place where he lay. That's where he was, where his body had been, but now is no more. In fact, there's, according to John, the grave clothes uh, that he has escaped, just laid out there, and the wrapping particularly that would have been placed around his head has been taken and neatly folded up and set aside, but Jesus is nowhere to be seen. And the angel proclaims or declares why he isn't here. He is risen, and that in accordance with what Jesus had himself predicted. So, it says that the angel gave this instruction to these women. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has been, that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. This is the angel. He's been sent on a mission. I've done my job. And so, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and with great joy, this mixture of terror and awe and joy. And they run to tell the disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Now, I want us again to to see all of this. The the, the angel has to use a phrase from the, the Cold War era in which the nuclear powers had a saying, or I think Reagan at least used this saying, we're going to trust one another to disarm, but we're also going to verify. Trust, but verify was the phrase. And it seems that God, through this angel, is inviting us into that same space to say, trust what I'm telling you. He is risen, but I'm, I'm moving the stone out of the way so that you can have empirical verification that the body is not here. So what I want us to see is that nobody expected that there would be no body, but yet when they arrive, the stone is rolled away and there is no body in the tomb. An angel is declaring that Jesus is risen. And what this does not mean is that Jesus' soul went to heaven and his body is still there. That his his body is still there in the tomb, but his soul has somehow gone to heaven. That's not what the angel's message was, nor was it what they witnessed. It does not mean that somehow his cause goes on. Jesus is still dead, but his cause will live on in the hearts of those who knew and love him. That's not what it meant. It does mean that the dead man, Jesus, who was crucified, that was laid down here on Friday, is alive and he is out and about. He is walking around. So, as I thought about that this week, and I thought about first the difficulty that they had in believing this, but ultimately coming to accept it based on the evidence that was set before them, and us today struggling to believe this, and especially as we try to present the message of the resurrected Christ to people in our culture, why is it that we often are met with incredulity, with people scoffing or finding this message uh, uh, difficult to embrace, difficult to believe. Well, I think it goes beyond the problem that they had. They expected Jesus' body to be in the tomb because that's what always happened. When people were dead and buried, they remained there. And so they were expecting that. But for us, it is a deeper problem because not only is that also our experience, but it is also our philosophical presupposition that the dead do not rise. And the reason for that is even deeper. It is because in the modern way of thinking, in the post-enlightenment way of thinking, the world that you and I in the West inhabit, the assumption is that death is fundamental. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. In the way that reality is explained to us in the worldview that's dominant in Western civilization now is that there once was a time when death reigned supreme. There was no life. There was energy or matter, but not what we would refer to in any way as biological or even conscious existence or, or life. There was death. And then for 
inexplicable reasons, at some point there was this brief period of time in which you and I happen to inhabit where there's life. But eventually, all of that will come to naught. And once more, as it was in the beginning, so will it be in the end, death. No biological existence and no conscious existence. That's what we are horizoned by. That's what we're eclipsed by. That's why everywhere you look, before, from eternity past to eternity future, there is death with sort of this strange, weird, inexplicable almost phenomenon of life as a blip on the scale of time in the middle. And so we speak of the miracle of life and the naturalness of death. Now, I would, I would suggest to you that those, I mean, maybe in some limited sense, those are appropriate, but those, those are not really biblical thoughts. To me, that's much more both of those expressions of a modernistic, almost atheistic worldview. The miracle of life and the naturalness of death. In other words, life to us is this strange anomaly, a mystery we can't really explain. The, the biogenesis, where, where does life come from? How does it get started? And how does it progress to the point that you have college sophomores sitting in the auditorium thinking, feeling, experiencing, consciousness, and all of that? that that's a mystery, an anomaly, a weird thing for a lifeless universe to kind of spit out. But, you know, here we are, so it must have happened. But ultimately, all around on the horizons, death, lifelessness, no consciousness, that's, that's the ultimate. And somehow this weird thing called life emerged in the middle. So the miracle, the inexplicable, weird existence of, of, of life and consciousness in, in a vast, bleak, unknowing, cold, dead universe. But the Bible turns all of that on its head. In fact, in the Bible, life is fundamental, not death. All things find their origin, according to Scripture, in the living God. I should have looked up before the sermon, it's too late now, but I don't know how many times, over and over and over again, that expression is used, both Old and New Testament, to describe God or to speak of God. He is the living God. He, he is... He is the ground of all being. He has life in himself, Jesus says. He is existence itself. And so when you look back on the horizons, both into eternity and past and present and future, what you see is not death out there, but life, the living God. He who was and is and is to come. We're alpha and omega. We're horizoned and surrounded by the living God. And life as we experience it as human beings in this world and in the realm that we inhabit on the level of human beings is a combining together of spirit and matter. That's the language of Scripture in Genesis 2 in verse 7 where it says, Then the Lord God, the living God, formed man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So the eternally living God takes the material of the earth, which does not possess life inherently within itself, but God breathes into it the breath of life. And death is then described for us as the separation of spirit and matter. In James chapter 2, James says, as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. We usually, and James's point there is to talk about the importance of faith and works being together, but here simply focus on the presupposition that James uses to, to define death as that separation 
of spirit, of the breath of life that God, the living and eternal God, has brought to bear on the, the, the material. So in the Bible, death is the unnatural intrusion that is in need of an explanation. Just as the materialistic worldview sees life as the oddity that needs explaining, the Bible describes death as the odd thing that needs explaining. We speak of death in our culture as natural, but then why is it that we all have such a problem with death? Why is it that we all avoid death? Why is it that we, that we all have this sense of death as being something alien? Something has gone wrong. I think that, that fits much more with the biblical explanation. But the Bible tells us that death is this unnatural intrusion that needs an explanation and originate, originated from a malicious lie in Genesis chapter 3 where Satan, in effect, told the creature, man, that he could live independently from spirit, the creator, the living God. In other words, the dust, the flesh, the matter from below could meaningfully exist apart from the spirit above. And man believing this lie resulted in his fall from the life-sustaining source of God's presence in the garden. And that's why death is attributed in Scripture to the work of Satan, John chapter 8. Jesus says that the devil was both a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Because of the lie that he told and because of man's belief in that lie, death is the consequence. He is a liar whose lies kill when believed. And we're told in Romans chapter 5 verse 12 that death is blamed on Adam who believed the lie. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men because all sinned. So, so death is the separation of the spirit from the body, of the above from the beneath, of the living God from matter that does not have life in itself because of the belief in a lie that has separated us from our creator, our maker, our sustainer. And therefore, death is attributed to Satan and to Adam. Satan is the teller of the lie, the murderer, and Adam is the believer of the lie, the murdered. And the gospel is, the good news is, that Jesus came to overthrow the works of both Satan and of Adam. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And the very beginning of his works is to separate man from God, above from below, heaven from earth, in order that death might appear and be the consequence of our existence apart from God. But Jesus comes to bring these back together, to destroy the works of the devil, to remove the malicious lies that he has told and spread about God, think, causing us to think that we could exist dependently from him, to bring us to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, he also says that just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. So Jesus comes to destroy the works of the devil and to reverse the effects of Adam and his sin. So that no longer is death the experience, but life in its place. So what does all of this mean? It means that I'm not here on this fine spring morning to tell you that we live in a cold, dead, meaningless universe. But rather that in a cold, dead, meaningless universe and that life is the strange and temporary phenomenon that we're just called to enjoy while it lasts. 
but rather to announce, I'm here this morning to announce the good news that from eternity to eternity, we are horizoned by the living God. And for now, there is this strange and temporary problem called death. But thank God, Jesus has conquered it and is coming again to share his victory with all who long for his appearing. So we believe that Jesus died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the grave and was seen. And we, ex- and we embrace all the blessings that pertain to that good news. And those blessings, as we bring this to a conclusion this morning, are laid out for us in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Number one, that we can usher, uh, utter taunts back at death. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? But the reason that we can do that is what he says right in the middle of this chapter where he writes that Christ is risen indeed. Um, he says that right on the heels uh, of, of a statement that we as Christians need to think about carefully, and that is if there is no resurrection of the dead, that we of all people are most to be pitied. But that's not the truth. But rather, the dead do rise, and Christ is risen. And because Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits, that is, he is the first of a harvest to come, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his turn, Christ the first fruits. Then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. I want us to try to connect this with all that we've been talking about over the course of this series. And all that we've been saying this morning. God the Father, who has life in himself, the living God, has sent his Son down into the world a world that had distanced itself from him and fallen into sin and death in order that he might come down and descend lower and lower and lower and keep going down until he himself took on death, even death on a cross, and down into the grave where in rising from the dead, he could in principle gather together all things and bring it back up, raise it back up into union with the life-giving God. The flesh will fail if we are hell-bent on denying the existence of that which is above if we cut ourselves off from the spirit and and focus only on the material, then we are locked into a cold, dead, and ultimately meaningless reality. But if there is a living God from whom we have been temporarily uh, separated because of our sin, but rescued through the lifeline given to us of the one who reconnects that which has been lost, Jesus Christ, dead, buried, and raised again, we have the promise and the hope that the one who raised him from the dead will likewise raise us when he comes again for his bride, the church. And so what's he doing now? He's reigning, he is ruling, he is subduing his enemies, putting them under his feet. And he must continue this process until the work is done. But then get verse 26, where we close this morning. That the last enemy to be destroyed 
is death. Death is an enemy. Death is not natural. Death is the enemy. It is the consequence of sin, a consequence that still echoes and lingers with us. But at its very heart, in Christ, it has been defeated. We see the victory that he has achieved over sin and the grave. And the witnesses that we have, the reliable witnesses who have given their testimony to having seen the risen Christ, forms the historical basis for our hope that this message is true, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is coming, and that he will share his indestructible life with all of those who yearn for his appearing. I'm looking for that day. I've, I've seen enough funerals, enough death, enough disease, enough of the consequences and ravages of a sin-cursed world that has fallen from God to not want that any longer. But you know, when you see the life of Jesus, not only in his resurrection, but throughout his ministry, these amazing things that he did, that again, people struggle to believe, but they struggle to believe it. And I hope that I'm getting this point across. They struggle to believe it because they believe that withered hands, blind eyes, deaf ears, death itself are the norm. That's just the way things are. But Jesus' miracles, they're not just demonstrations of his power to prove that he was someone great. They are signs of his kingdom. He's showing us in these acts that this is how things are supposed to be. This is how things really are. And that death and disease and destruction and ruin, this is the anomaly. This is the strange and weird thing, but it will not always be so. And so we look for and we long for the day of his appearing in which death, the final enemy, is defeated and destroyed. And in that hope, we take our stand. In our hope, this is the gospel. And in our hope, we can look at death and say, where is your sting? In the grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a Christian this morning, we want to extend his invitation to you to come to not look at your life as being horizoned by death and cold meaninglessness, but in the living God who loves you, who gave his son for you, that you would come and put him on, be united with him in baptism and look for the day of his appearing. If we can help you in that, would you let us know while we stand and while we sing?